In this video, I'm gonna explain what really causes hair loss. Now, you may find what I'm about to say unexpected or even controversial, but when you really look at the evidence, the answer is actually pretty obvious. Most importantly, when you understand the real cause of hair loss, you'll be much better equipped to deal with it in the long term and keep your hair thick and healthy for many decades to come. All right, guys, let's get into it and reveal what really causes hair loss. So there are various types of hair loss, but the most common one in both men and women is pattern hair loss. Other names for it are androgenetic alopecia or simply baldness. For men in particular, pattern hair loss is by far the most common type of hair loss. Male pattern baldness can appear as early as adolescence and becomes more common with age. Eventually, it affects around 80% of men in their 70s. The baldness starts from the front part of the head in the temple area before spreading to the back of the head, the so-called crown. The two balding regions continue to grow until eventually they fuse, leading the entire part of the head to go bald. It's really important to note that men who have androgenetic hair loss may also have another hair loss disorder as well. That's why it's incredibly important to get a correct diagnosis and figure out which type of hair loss you have before starting various treatments. With that said, male pattern baldness is by far the most common type and is characterized by a process known as hair follicle miniaturization. This refers to the gradual shrinking of the hair follicles the microscopic structures out of which the hairs grow. This leads gradually to thinner, shorter, less pigmented hair. Eventually, the hairs become so small that they don't even protrude through the scalp. In advanced baldness, many of the follicles disappear altogether. There is a strong genetic component to the condition, meaning that it tends to run in families. Studies with identical twins find that if one has it, there is an 80 to 90% chance the second one will also have it. So there's clearly something in the genes that predisposes to baldness, but what exactly is it? Well, scientists understood at least since the 1950s that male hormones, so-called androgens, were causally involved in pattern hair loss. This understanding came from the observation that men castrated before puberty did not develop hair loss. But when these men were injected with testosterone, they regained the tendency to baldness. In the years since, scientists understood that the androgen responsible was not testosterone, but another hormone that is synthesized through testosterone. Its name is dihydrotestosterone, or DHT for short. Scientists realized this when they discovered a group of males with a genetic mutation that prevented them from naturally synthesizing DHT, even though their bodies could still make testosterone. These men never went bald. This understanding was the impetus behind the release in the 1990s of the drug finasteride. One finasteride pill daily lowered blood DHT levels by an average of 70%. This resulted in a stabilization of hair loss for over 85% of users, a truly remarkable statistic back in the day. As exciting as finasteride's results were, however, they were far from the real cure in any sense of the word. Firstly, a sizable minority of users, around 10 to 15%, did not respond to it at all. But even in those who did respond, only a small percentage saw significant hair regrowth. Most had minimal or no regrowth. These limitations of finasteride reflect problems with the DHT theory of hair loss itself. To this day, scientists don't understand exactly how DHT causes pattern hair loss. They also don't understand why DHT can cause baldness in some men, but not others. Other Paradoxes in the DHT theory of hair loss include the fact that men with hair loss aren't likely to have higher blood levels of DHT than normal. Hair loss also becomes more common with old age, even though levels of DHT in the body remain flat and its overall significance in the body declines. This lack of understanding is reflected in an almost complete lack of progress in treating hair loss from an androgen perspective until now. But We'll come back to that later in this video. More than 40 years since finasteride hit the market and no alternative medication or treatment that targets DHT in a more effective manner has appeared. On the contrary, there has been a proliferation of unrelated treatments that are at least as effective or more effective than finasteride. These include treatments like scalp massage, platelets-rich plasma, light therapy, and microneedling, as well as compounds like caffeine, adenosine, and cetirizine, to name a few. This proliferation of treatments that are unrelated to androgens has brought a number of other molecules to the attention of scientists. One of these are the prostaglandins. These are a group of lipid compounds that act as a signaling molecule in the body, influencing a variety of physiological processes, including inflammation. There are four major prostaglandins, and the receptors for all of them have been found in hair 
follicles. There are also major differences in the levels of various prostaglandins between balding and non-balding hair. Also, prostaglandin mimicking medications like latanoprost and bimatoprost have been found to stimulate hair growth in a manner similar to minoxidil. All this suggests that prostaglandins are somehow involved in hair loss, but it's not yet clear exactly how. Now, we mentioned inflammation earlier in a reference to the prostaglandins, and this is a common feature in male androgenetic alopecia. You can actually see the inflammation at the upper portion of the hair follicles under a microscope. Scientists sometimes call it microinflammation. This is in order to distinguish it from the highly destructive, raging inflammation found in other types of alopecia that can lead to complete hair loss in a short amount of time. This microinflammation is often accompanied by a pathological accumulation of collagen around the hair follicles. This collagen eventually hardens up and forms microscopic scar tissue, which chokes out the hair follicles, making regrowth very difficult. The longer the hair loss progresses, the more extensive and irreversible the fibrotic buildup becomes. Another classic sign of baldness is the reduction in supply of blood to the affected areas. Compared to those with healthy hair, the scalp of men with hair loss receives around two and a half times less blood. As blood carries the oxygen and other compounds that are necessary for normal cell functioning, this reduction in blood flow can have very negative consequences for the follicles. Now, a big issue with hair loss science regards the extent to which these changes are a cause or a consequence of hair loss. In other words, is the inflammation, fibrosis, and impaired blood flow a side effect of the balding process, or is it causally linked to it? And if it is causally linked, is the process independent of DHT, or does it work in conjunction with DHT? Now, while there are no definitive answers to these questions, an intriguing possibility suggests that all these effects are a manifestation of yet another underlying factor, chronic tension of the scalp. You see, the scalp tissues are subject to chronic tension on account of their connections with the frontalis muscle above the forehead and the occipitalis muscle at the back of the head. And simulations show that the tension in the scalp is correlated with the propensity to baldness. In other words, those parts of the head that experience the highest stress go bald first, followed by those with intermediate tension and so on. Those areas on the side and the back of the head which are immune to hair loss or not subject to this tension. The chronic tension in turn is believed to trigger the chronic inflammation, which in turn increases DHT activity. The inflammation also induces the release of a signaling protein called transforming growth factor beta-1, or TGF-beta-1. The simultaneous activity of DHT and TGF-beta-1 then sets in motion the gradual process of parafollicular fibrosis, which chokes out the follicles and makes recovery from baldness very difficult. Fibrosis also squeezes the tiny blood vessels, supplying blood to the scalp, restricting blood flow, and further inhibiting the follicle's ability to properly carry out normal hair growth cycle. According to this model, hair loss is a much more complicated process than earlier simplistic view of it all being down to DHT and acting directly on hair follicles. The model also explains how DHT is necessary but not sufficient factor in baldness. In other words, while you require DHT to go bald, there are other factors involved that must work in conjunction with DHT to initiate and sustain the balding process. And at the foundation of the entire process lies scalp tension. Now, people sometimes claim that hair transplants prove that scalp tension does not play a role in hair loss. How can you transplant hairs from the back of the head into the front and they continue to grow fine? Well, actually, those transplanted hairs will eventually miniaturize if the patient doesn't take finasteride. In fact, we even know that smaller grafts miniaturize faster than larger grafts and the patient doesn't take finasteride. This just clearly goes to show that the location of the scalp is vitally important because of scalp tension, because the hairs on the back of the head remain perfectly healthy. Larger graft sizes start miniaturizing more slowly than smaller ones because there's more additional tissue surrounding the hair follicle bulb, which gives it more protection against the forces of scalp tension and fibrosis. So in fact, hair transplants actually prove that scalp tension and blood flow play a vital role in hair growth. Others say that blood flow plays no role in hair growth, and yet we know that simply injecting a part of the blood back into the scalp directly is very, very effective for hair growth. Could it be any more obvious? <laughs> Others ask why women don't go bald like men. Do they not have the same levels of scalp tension? Well, actually, they don't have the same levels of DHT. And as we know, DHT plays a role. Think about it like this. Chronic inflammation from scalp tension plus DHT equals fibrosis, equals reduced blood flow and growth space, equals hair follicle miniaturization, equals male pattern baldness. Reducing scalp tension will allow you to block the process at the root cause and stop hair loss in a natural, long-lasting way 
free from side effects. The best way to achieve this at the present moment is with a state-of-the-art device known as the Grow Band. The Grow Band has gained massive popularity in the last year or so as an effective way to reduce scalp tension and restore adequate blood flow to the balding areas of the scalp. It works by gently lifting up the scalp around the perimeter. By gently pushing upwards, it reduces muscular tension and causes pinching and squeezing at the top of the scalp, which helps reduce fibrosis. Now, the Grow Band is fully automated, which means all you need to do is put it on your head, choose the right settings, and let it do the hard work of massaging your scalp. Scalp massages are a great option, but the problem is that they require a lot of cumulative hours of massaging to see results. So not many people stick with massages for long enough to actually see the results. The Grow Band solves this, making massages easy, automated, and hands-free. So you can get on with your day doing useful tasks like, uh, watching YouTube videos whilst using the Grow Band. Users are getting amazing results and the longer you use it, the better results you will get. The Grow Band was designed by top engineers and scientists from the University of Bristol and the University of Birmingham in the UK and has undergone rigorous safety and effectiveness testing prior to being launched. Right now, the Grow Band is only available over at hairguard.com, so click the link below. If you've got any questions or comments, hit me up in the comments section and don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.